the Manchester Quartet's fusion of quintessentially English wit and whimsy with balls-out guitar heroics had set a blueprint for practically every major British alternative band that followed, especially the Stone Roses and Oasis. Moreover, the creative core of the band comprised the singer Morrissey and guitarist Johnny Marr, whose devoted but fractious relationship was strangely similar to that of the Libertines' joint frontman. The Libertines' profile began to extend beyond their East End stamping ground in early 2002, when they supported the Strokes and the Vines on UK tours. Both headliners had been seen as standard bearers for a no-frills brand of punk-influenced guitar music, and casual gig-goers probably thought that the Below the Title act would offer the same sort of thing. The Libertines shattered these preconceptions with their urchin antics. Cockney wordplay and, at one South Coast gig, a 20-minute free jazz workout. It was punk of sorts, but it was light years away from the mannered revivalism of the main attractions. The Libertines maintained their affinity for difficult twosomes within seminal English bands when they chose the producer for their debut single. Bernard Butler had been the guitarist and co-songwriter for the band Suede before his relationship with singer Brett Anderson became rancid during the recording of their second album. He later formed an on-off partnership with the singer David McCalmont, which was also stormy. The song chosen as the Libertines' first bulletin to the wider world was What a Waster, a track that seemed to combine all their influences in the space of a few seconds. The raw passion of the jam was unleashed on what seemed like a hungover East End pub sing-along, albeit one that included references to the works of James Joyce and the biblical book of Revelation. It was rock and roll, Jim, but not as Americans know it, with its references to divvies and spivs. All you need to understand, proud residents of our former colonies, is that you don't want to be called either of them, y'all. You probably know some of the other words in the song, though, specifically the ones that begin with an F and C. Unfortunately, so did the censors at BBC Radio 1, and What a Waster was Z-listed into oblivion. Complete bunch of effing Cs. Undeterred by this ticking off from the man, the Libertines celebrated the release of the single within feedback distance of Buckingham Palace. This was partly a clever bid for posterity. The Sex Pistols had signed one of their numerous abortive record deals by the railings of Mrs Windsor's London pad. More significantly, the event was timed to coincide with the Queen's Golden Jubilee, and the Libertines' antics provided a smart contrast with the anemic bleating of posh gay pop idol Will Young and pram-faced gobshite's atomic kitten on the other side of the gates. Pete and Carl had unshakable faith in their mission, but they probably weren't expecting what happened next. What a Waster, despite being blackballed by national radio, became single of the week in the NME and even breached the UK Top 40, a battleground that had been dominated by vacuous boy and girl bands and pikey clubland monstrosities for years. This was despite the band's attempt to sabotage their own success by nicking copies of the single from the Virgin Megastore. The Libertines' success was partly down to timing. The Strokes, the Vines and the White Stripes had made guitar rock cool again and the Libertines were part of a groundswell that included The Darkness, Interpol, Franz Ferdinand, The Coral, British Sea Power and the 80s Matchbox Beeline Disaster. But the Libertines had something else. Their defiant Englishness put them in a parallel tradition that led back to the days of music hall and working men's clubs, a path followed by bands such as Madness, who never enjoyed the adulation they deserved on the other side of the Atlantic. As The Clash had defined it on their debut album back in 1977, I'm so bored with the USA. And who should pop up as the Libertines' greatest celebrity fan but the guitarist, co-writer and occasional singer of The Clash, Mick Jones. The Libertines, it seemed, were kings of the hill as their idols came to pay homage and the fawning media lapped up every word they uttered. But dark rumours started to trickle out about what life as a Libertine was really like vicious arguments in the studio, behind-the-scenes punch-ups and the ever-present spectre of heavy drug use seemed to be as much part of the band's existence as the songs. The tension that made the band special was also threatening to destroy them. No, 
no idea what we wanted to do. I think it's, um, it's just like a bit of a photograph in time, really, of what of what we were feeling and you know, what was going on around us. I think, you know, if you've got more opportunities just to go into the studio and put stuff down, then we'd have a lot more records. I just think we'd be, you know, we had to get it down and we had, and it had to have a certain sense of validity. And I think we managed to achieve that, really. I mean, I don't, I don't think we'd be, we wouldn't have released it if it had just been a rush job. By the summer of 2002, things were getting pretty surreal. Only a few months before, the band members had been living in dank poverty, and now Mick Jones was producing their debut album. Jones was the only ex-member of The Clash to have managed something approaching a commercially successful career, having fronted two incarnations of the political dance rock outfit Big Audio Dynamite. It seemed as if the Libertines had leapfrogged all the other strat-toting hopefuls populating the letters page of the NME and were officially members of the Rock and Roll Premiership. To add to the aura of historical significance, recording sessions took place in the legendary RAK studios, which in the 1970s had been the spawning ground for hits for such glam rock titans as Susie Quattro and Mud. Inevitably, rock success leads to rock excess. It's common knowledge that a high profile in the music business means increased access to groupies and drugs. Even if the musicians choose not to partake, the temptation is always there. Booze and dope are simply part of the wallpaper. Ecstasy and amphetamines are normal. And the first advance from the record company means that a few lines of decent quality cocaine become affordable on a Saturday night. But for some people, these aren't enough. And it soon became apparent that Pete Dirty was some people. The baby-faced epitome of the libertine lifestyle was searching for his own personal Arcadia with the help of heroin and crack cocaine. Up to a point, the other band members could tolerate this, provided it didn't affect his musical abilities. But the pressure on the band to succeed, coupled with Pete's tendency to turn himself into a walking, talking chemistry set on a regular basis, led to moments of extreme tension in the studio. At one point, this led to an all-out fistfight between Pete and Carl, which might have been hushed up had it not been immediately followed by a gig in Scarborough. Pete didn't show up, although whether this was voluntary or on Carl's orders remains unclear to this day. The immediate assumption outside the band was that Pete was gone for good, and it seemed as if the Libertines were taking more than just musical inspiration from their mentors. Suede had never capitalised on the promise of their first two albums after Bernard Butler left. The Clash's history after Joe Strummer fired Mick Jones was something of an embarrassment. And when Johnny Marr left the Smiths following the recording of their album, Strange Ways Here We Come, the band only had a matter of weeks left to live. But the bond between Pete and Carl was, it seemed, too strong to be sundered by knuckles alone. They dabbed each other's wounds with Arcadian iodine and completed the album, which now bore the quintessentially English title, Up the Bracket. Released in October, their full-length debut confounded cynics, who thought they were just a bunch of Cockney chancers. It crammed more musical ideas and lyrical gems into its 36 minutes than most bands manage in a whole career. The songs constantly blend the gritty, mundane realities of life with bigger themes. The title track compares a bit of London bother with the story of Joseph, as told in the Book of Genesis. Similarly, The Boy Looked at Johnny is about former Libertines bass player Johnny Borrell, who went on to front the band Razorlight. But the title also harks back to the heyday of punk and a novel written by Julie Burchill and Tony Parsons, then the hip young gunslingers of the NME. Meanwhile, Horror Show is a pretty explicit contemplation of heroin, with a title borrowed from Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange. The boys in the band raises the grubby realities of groupies and backstage hangers-on to the level of mythology, backed by a swaggering rhythm that owes as much to sea shanties and music hall as it does to rock and roll. But the key track is The Good Old Days. Not only does it mate the ancient British warrior Queen Boadicea with the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, but it includes a line that may as well be a credo for the libertines. If you've lost your faith in love and music, the end won't be long. The faith of the band and the fans would be sorely tested in the coming months, and it often seemed as if the end had already happened. We 
Well, I think probably because, well, I think Libertine is quite an honest band, you know, we don't try and disguise anything, don't put anything on, you know. By the last weeks of 2002, it really seemed as if the Libertines were the centre of the musical universe. In November, they were able to pay homage to another of their heroes, when Morrissey, former leader of the Smiths, invited them to support him at London's Brixton Academy. The band's next single, Time for Heroes, had lyrics that could have sprung from Morrissey's jotter. There are few more distressing sights than that of an Englishman in a baseball cap. Signalled that the Libertines weren't going to kiss any transatlantic asses, spelt with an R, thank you very much, in their pursuit of international fame. The single improved on the performance of previous offerings, reaching number 20. A triumphant few months climaxed in February when the Libertines were dubbed Best New Band in the annual NME Awards. And then things started going a bit wonky. Unusually, it was Karl Barat who proved to be the weak link in the chain. Just before a major European tour, he contracted pneumonia and all gigs were cancelled. However, he recovered within a matter of weeks and the Libertines staged a gig in the Bethnal Green flat he shared with Pete Dirty, no near and far as the Albion Rooms. This impromptu performance quickly became an integral part of the Libertines' myth. Like the Sex Pistols' performance at the 100 Club, if everyone who says they were there had really shown up, the gig would have been at Madison Square Garden. As it was, there were about 40 people crammed into the flat, far too many bodies for the capacity of a modest Victorian conversion, and when windows started breaking, the police soon rolled up. Pete and Carl played the Clash song, Guns of Brixton, as PC Plod ordered everyone to clear out. When they kick at your front door, how are you going to come? They bawled. But the answer seemed to be, quite peacefully, thank you for asking, officer. The only downside to the whole affair was that the police didn't actually arrest anyone, which rather went against the band's lawless image. But there would be time enough for the long arm of the law in the coming months. The Albion Rooms gig appeared to be a defiant statement, an acknowledgement that the Libertines were always going to do things their own way. Keeping true to the ideals of Arcadia, nobody was going to tell them that a rock and roll gig could only take place in a designated venue with overpriced beer and queues for the stinking toilets. It seemed to be a defiant statement of the Libertines' independence from the normal laws of music business economics. In fact, the reality was somewhat different. Pete Doherty's interpretation of Arcadia had led to his drug habits spiralling out of control. Carl had become fed up with the assorted crackheads and other human debris who constantly turned up in the flat and had decided to move into new accommodation. The Albion Rooms gig, far from being a statement of togetherness, was Carl's leaving party. Mm -hmm. 